Hi everybody, welcome to this week's live stream. Um, it is week 8 and today we'll be discussing the chromosomal basis of inheritance. I hope everyone's having a good day so far and let's go ahead and get started. The first question, um, so this, is, this section is solving problems when the genetics are known, so we're still going to be doing some crosses this week, a little bit similar to next week but diving a bit deeper into probabilities. Number one says, an organism that has the genotype of big A, little a, big B, little b, big C, little c is crossed with an organism that has the genotype big A, big A, big B, little b, big C, little c. Assume all genes are on separate sets of chromosomes, meaning they are not linked. So part A asks, what is the probability that any of the offspring will have this specific genotype? So like last time, we broke it down and we're going to be doing the same thing here. Um, I'll cross to get A, I'm going to be crossing the A's of the two organisms to get the probability of getting big B, big B, I'll be crossing the B's. And then to get the probability of big C, big C, I'll be crossing C. It's easiest just to break this up into its parts. Actually, I'm going to be putting um, this organism at the top every time just to keep it consistent. So in these three, we're looking for homozygous dominant of each of these genes. And we can see here, oh, this is um, big C. That in this box, there is a half chance of getting the desired allele. In this box, there's only a fourth chance of obtaining big B, big B, and in this box, similar to B, there's a fourth chance. So, like last time, to get the probability of getting all of these in one, you would just multiply that out and the answer would be 1 over 32. And this is just the chance of this genotype. So similarly, if we're looking at these three now instead, we can multiply these and we can all use the same squares, but I'll fill them out so that we can see what's going on. So the probability of getting big A, little a, um, is this helping? I put it a little bit closer to my mouth, but I'm using my over ear headphones, so I'm trying to fix that volume. I'll also try to talk louder. So in this box we have a half chance probability of getting big A little a, a half chance probability of getting big B little b, and a fourth chance probability of getting little c, little c. So then we just multiply those together. And this would give us the answer of a 1 16th chance of getting the genotype of big A, little a, big B, little b, and little c, little c. 
Okay. Sorry. Thank you for working with me. Great. So now we're considering an even larger cross with now five alleles. And so now to get the probability here, we would uh, tackle it the same way. But conceptually, we can be thinking about what these would look like. I'm sure that all of you are pretty familiar with the Punnett square. So if we're crossing big A, little a, and big A, big A, the probability of getting big A, little a is one fourth, and we know that because if we were to one half, sorry, if we were to draw that out, half of the column would be what we're looking for. So you know that that's one half. And for B, the probability of getting big B, big B is also one half. With C, the probability of getting big C, little c is also one half. And then we can see here all of the offspring for homozygous recessive homozygous dominant is going to come out like this. So we can say that 100% of the time, or just times 1, we would see big D, little d. And then for big E, big E, we would see that 1 fourth of the time. And so this all multiplied together is a 1 in 30 second chance of this happening. And for B, using the same Punnett squares that we created above, it's asking for big A, big A, big B, big B, big C, big C, big D, big D, little e, little e. So for A, we can see that that's right here, half a chance, big B, big B is half a chance, big C, big C, however, as we can see here, is not possible. So our probability for that would be zero. If you come across something like this in a gene pool, you can pretty much stop here, but just to hone in the point, we can also start moving forward to D, big D, big D. We saw that in this cross, 100% of the time, we got a heterozygous D allele. Therefore, the probability of getting a big D, big D is also zero. And then the probability of getting little e, little e is just one fourth. Doesn't really matter, but it's good to go through it. And so getting this genotype will never happen because the cross that is happening between these two parents will not yield um, all of the desired alleles. Awesome. So for the next question, question three, it goes between two pages, but I'll read it aloud to you. In fruit flies, um, the well-known Drosophila melanogaster, mel melanogaster, <laughs> the most common eye color is red. A mutation or allele for eye color produces white eyes. The gene is located on the X chromosome, so we know that this is X-linked. What is the probability that a heterozygous red-eyed female, because we know that white eye is recessive, mated with a white-eyed male will produce any white-eyed offspring? When looking at um, sex chromosomes, 
this is going to be um, just a W without anything is going to be referred to as a normal allele or the dominant allele or red eye. And W plus is going to be the recessive for white. So you can think of W as like big D and W plus as little d. But it's just denoting that this is a defective gene. So what we would be crossing is a heterozygous red-eyed female, which looks like what we drew up here, with a white-eyed male. And we know that males only have one X chromosome, so if this male has white eyes, then his X chromosome must carry the defective gene. And when we do this cross, we get the following genotypes. So the probability that they will produce any white-eyed offspring is just the amount of offspring in this Punnett square that is white-eyed. The female here is white-eyed because it has two recessive and the male here is white-eyed because it um, has a recessive gene. It's a lot easier, and you'll see this pattern, and I'm sure this has been reiterated to you in class, but just remember that it's a lot easier for males with sex-linked recessive um, diseases to express them because they only have one X chromosome. If they get an X chromosome with the recessive diseased allele, that will be expressed. So we can say that the probability of any white-eyed offspring is one half. And if we move down here, what is the probability that the mating in part will produce any white-eyed females? Now we're talking specifically about um, not only being a carrier or expressing, but the sex of the offspring. So in this case, I like to think about it in two parts. Um, one is, what is the probability of having a female offspring? And then, what is the probability of that female offspring having a white-eyed, expressing white eyes? So the probability of having a female, as we can see here in this box, is one half. And we multiply that by the probability of white eyes, which is highlighted in yellow, as one half. So half of the time that you have a girl, um, a female, white eyes will be expressed. So the probability is one fourth total. And similarly with white eyed males, um, oh I don't think this is supposed to be in here, this is a typo for the key, but it's the same math. So the probability of producing um, any white eyed males is one fourth because the probability of having a male is a half chance, and the probability of that male getting that defective um, allele is also a half chance, which is one-fourth. Great. Number four. A heterozygous brown-eyed human female who is a carrier of color blindness. This is sex-linked. marries a blue-eyed male who is not colorblind. Colorblindness is a sex-linked trait. Assume that eye color is autosomal and that brown is dominant over blue. What is the probability that any of the offspring produced will have the following traits? Let's first write out our parent crosses. So the female has brown eyes And if it's not specified, um, assume that it is homozygous, but in this case it is specified. It says um, heterozygous brown-eyed female. They will always specify whether it's homozygous or hetero. So that's for the 
brown eyes, and then the carrier of color blindness. In this case, we're going to put a plus for normal, and then just CB for a carrier of color blindness. And then the male that is crossed with has blue eyes. We're going to put little b, little b. And this male is not colorblind. So there we go. So the probability that um, we're just going to write down the probabilities for each one of these by doing separate crosses. The probability, probability of having brown eyes is a half chance. And um, so for the Y chromosome, we don't necessarily think of it as recessive. We just kind of ignore it. Um, so there's, there's always going to be, I'm gonna, just going to scroll back up here um, and do across like this. So no matter what, there's always a half chance of being a male. So it's not a recessive, a Y is not a recessive thing, it's just simplistically um, when two, when a zygote is formed and offspring is created, half the time it's going to come out male. That's the probability. The X chromosome carries a lot more genetic information than the Y chromosome does. So that's why the X is always expressed. The X chromosome carries, um, I think 120 or something around that. I know that it's an answer later, but hundreds of genes, whereas the Y chromosome only has 12. And so when you have a half chance of being a male um, and collecting whatever X, X chromosome comes from the maternal parent, that's why colorblindness is expressed so much uh, more frequently in males is because when they get that X chromosome that is for colorblindness, it's always expressed. But because colorblindness is recessive, when you are female and you have two X chromosomes and you're a carrier, you will not express colorblindness, though you do have it on an X chromosome. For females, you have to have two X chromosomes that are affected for a recessive um, something to be expressed. So I hope that helps. So there's a half chance for brown eyes. We can see here. And yes, so colorblindness is an X recessive linked thing. I don't like saying disease. It sounds wrong. But <laughs> yeah, colorblindness is X linked and a recessive trait. There's a half chance of blue eyes. And then for color blindness, we have a female who is a carrier, a male who does not have it. So in this case, color blindness occurs only one fourth of the time. And this is because it's only expressed in this male. I'll use a different color, but so though this female is a carrier of color blindness, it's recessive and so it's not expressed, therefore the probability of expression of color blindness is only one fourth. The probability of colorblind males between these two is one half. And now to get these two, we're just going to be multiplying probabilities. So brown eyed was one half chance, and then colorblind males was also one half chance. So the probability of getting a brown eyed colorblind male as an offspring has a one fourth chance. For blue eyes, there was also half a chance, but for colorblind females, we didn't see any. 
So there's a zero chance of having a blue-eyed and colorblind female because there's no prob there's no chance of having a colorblind female in this case. And so similarly to here, um, as I explained up there, the probability of having males that are colorblind is one half because we're specifying males. If it said, what's the probability of having colorblind children, we would say one half because out of these four, I mean one fourth because of out of these four probabilities, only one of them expresses colorblindness. But because we're only looking at two options. There is a one half chance that colorblindness will be expressed in males. And if they asked for females, if G was, um, what is the probability that any of the males would be colorblind, it would be zero, correct. For question H, we went over this um, a little bit earlier, so why do males show sex-linked traits more often than females? And I'll just write a quick synopsis on the next page. And that is because males only have one X chromosome. So the X uh, chromosome in humans, and I was wrong about a few hundred, I just looked it up, so it actually carries a few thousand genes and the Y carries only a few dozen genes. And that's a huge difference. So females have two alleles for every gene on the X chromosome. And if females have the recessive phenotype, it is only expressed when both X's carry that recessive allele. But for most genes on the X chromosomes, male need to have only the one recessive allele to show or display the phenotype. So that's why it's more probable. And Carrie's express genes is referring to um, that X chromosome. Great. Moving on to the next problem set, we'll just read this and we'll go ahead and move on to the next page. So an understanding of Mendelian genetics allows us to determine the theoretical probabilities associated with normal transmission of autosomal and sex-linked alleles during reproduction. This understanding provides us with strategies for solving genetics problems. In real life situations, geneticists use the strategies to determine the genetics behind specific phenotypic traits in organisms. They do, to, they do this by conducting controlled crosses of experimental organisms or by analyzing family pedigrees. Um, to answer your question, there are no specific Y-linked chromosomes. You will not be seeing alleles linked to any Y-link when it specifies X-linked that gives you an indication that there is a higher probability of expression in males, but that's it. The Y chromosome, um, we can kind of not think about at all. <laughs> we can just ignore it when it comes to males entirely. So there are a couple of problems um, presented on the next few pages, and I'm also always happy to help for everybody watching, so please ask questions if needed. Um, two problems are presented in each are given a wild population that has the phenotypic characteristics um, of wild population of fruit flies that were trapped randomly. And then in B, cross, crosses 1 and 2 and on, the phenotypic traits of offspring from a controlled cross are seen. And so the phenotypes of the parents are indicated after each cross. This is just showing us how they're going to set it up. And it read out loud. Um, Sounds a bit confusing, but it's a lot easier when you just have the plan squares in front of you. So for problem one, we have the wild population and then what it looks like when it's crossed. And as we can see here, both A and B is asking us, so what, what does cross one tell you about the dominance versus recessiveness of the alleles? And just using a highlighter, the wild type 
versus ambler. We can see here that ambler is going to be the recessive. For males all across and females all across, the number of them seen in each one is similar to each other. So 33 is similar to 31, 17 is similar to 19, and above all they are in even numbers. So when this is a wild population and we're crossing male ambers, amblers, with female wild type, then we get something that looks like this. And as, as we look across, all of the numbers look relatively even. When they do that first cross, 29 is similar to 29, 24, similar enough to 31. They're almost in even proportions as they were before. Um, and to answer your question, a wild type is a, a gene that prevails among in, in natural condition, condition so it's, it's distinct from atypical. If we were to say um, that being six foot four, blonde haired, and long fingered nailed were all wild type, then anything differing from somebody who had those traits would be considered different. So a wild type is just the most common thing seen in nature. So we can think about it as a dominant allele. Yes. That's awesome. Okay. So we can see here that we can't tell if it's X-linked because everything seems evenly spread across males and female. And we see that there are a relatively equal number of both phenotypes. So it is not possible to determine dominance in this case because there's not enough information. If everything is seeming in, um, seemingly in uh, accordance with a one-to-one -one ratio with each other, it's equally showing up in both males and females, then we can't say that it's X-linked and we also can't say that Ambler is dominant over wild type. So that's what we're seeing when we're crossing. Though the first, and I know that was um, a bit contradictory to what I said earlier with the wild type meeting the dominant allele, wild type is the most seen in nature. And so it's crosses like this that we're doing now that determine the dominance. So they can be dominant, they also don't have to be dominant. In this case, because we're, we're cross-checking a wild type with um, a fly that is ambler, and we're getting a one-to-one -one in the, the first ratio, then we can't tell if that wild type is actually dominant or if it was just a chance that it was seen more when captured. And then this is asking what does cross one tell you about the placement of the alleles on autosomes versus sex chromosomes, and like we said earlier, because the number of male and female is the same, we're going to assume that this is autosomal. But because it is spread out, we can also say that it's not possible to determine because there's not enough information. This is just an inference. The sign-up sheet um, goes up in just one minute. I usually do it around 5.30. So now we have yet a second cross, and what this problem is showing us is that the more that you do cross as you go from parental generation to F1 to F2, it's going to tell you more about the genes because it's going to show you evolutionarily what it likes to do. If um, We've seen that brown hair is dominant, and so through our generations as human beings, maybe we tend to see um, brown hair more dominant um, amongst in individuals and so we can we can see that generationally and so when you keep crossing 
more information about these genes um, arises. So A is asking, what does cross 2 tell you about the dominance versus recessiveness? What I find interesting is that males are 0 for wild type, but there are 32 females for wild type. And in Ambler, there's 32 males and zero females. So this tells us that because all males are Ambler and all females are wild type, this is an indication of um, recessiveness. And going further with that, B asks, what does it tell us about the placement of alleles on um, autosomes versus sex length? Because we're only seeing ambler and males, and that led us to believing that it was recessive, then we can determine that the alleles are on the X chromosome. The cross um, for this one would have been this. So because um, male progeny are always going to receive an X from the mom, and that we saw all male progeny expressing, then we can assume that the mother is homozygous for that ambler. Okay, moving on to problem two. Now we're looking at monocle, bifocal, trifocal, spinner, and shiny. I think this has to do with just sight and activity. So in this first cross and um, in the pair cross and cross one is asking us what cross one tells us about dominance versus recessive. Um, when you see two genes that cancel out, so MT and BT across the board on all fronts are zero from what they previously were up top. Because both of them go away, um, we can see a link of codominance. An example of this being if you, if you have a white flower and a red flower and a pink flower is, an exp is expressed, then you're going to get zero probabilities for white and you're going to get zero probabilities for red. So you can kind of say like they're not showing but they technically are, it's just codominance. So this would indicate that MT and BT are codominant. And because we're seeing even proportions of TR in males and females to the total, we can say that TR is heterozygote because it's showing up evenly.
The one that we haven't talked about that I've been hesitant to thus far is discussing these SP versus SH genes. In this first cross, it is difficult to tell and understand whether it's dominant or recessive because unfortunately they do show up in even numbers when they do show up. So we can say that there is not enough information for SP and SH. B asks what it tells us about the placement of the alleles on um, autosomes or chromosomes. Uh, because we're seeing even proportions of male and female in codominance and in TR, we're just going to assume that it is autosomal. It's showing up the same all the way through these, so we can't determine, like we did previously, that it is um, X-linked. However, we said previously that there's not enough information for SP and SH, so we can assume that autosomal is for MT, BT, and TR, but we're unsure about whether SP and SH are sex linked. If we do a further cross, we get um, pretty interesting ratios. We see clearly now for SP just how much more it shows up than SH over here. And so this information would tell us that it is in fact X-linked. where SP is dominant. So SP shows up in females every single time, but does not show up in females when it's SH. Because there's an even split between the two, we can determine that SH is recessive, and I'll show that in a cross, because um, I feel like what I'm saying is making it a little bit muddy. So if the female was XSP, XSH, and the male was XSPY, this female still shows up as an SP female. We're not seeing any SHs, but we are seeing SHs for males. And we know that half the time it can be SP or SH, so that makes sense for 8V8. dominant, X-linked, SH, recessive, X-linked, MT, and BT are co-dominant in TR is a heterozygote. So as we said above, what does cross tell us about the placement of alleles? We know that SP, SH are X-linked, MT, BT, and TR are autosomal.
Now we're going to move on to pedigrees. Um, pedigrees are super fun. I really like um, doing this analysis. And so using this pedigree, and I'll be switching back and forth between this page because unfortunately I couldn't get it onto one page, but we'll be using this pedigree to answer some questions. Looking at the generation two offspring of the two generation one brothers, what can you say about the genes controlling the genetic disorder? Is the disorder caused by a gene that is dominant or recessive, autosomal, or sex-linked? And then, what additional information do you gain from examining Generation 3's offspring? So, we know that these two are siblings, so I'll just do this. Um, and this is not a hard and fast rules, rule that you may see in your textbooks, but I learned this in genetics and I find it um, easier to wrap my head around. When you're seeing um, mating partners that are coming in from outside of the family, we assume those to be unaffected if it is a recessive gene. So. Because these two are brothers, we know that in this family at least, this gene's going around. But because this mating partner here is also affected, that's pretty unusual for a recessive. And we're seeing this a lot throughout. This is not um, very sparse. So because of the amount of people that are affected and because of um, incoming mating partners being affected, which is rare, if it's recessive, we can say that this is dominant. The gene, though, may be autosomal or sex-linked based on these data because if it's dominant, a female is probably going to express it just as much as a male because if it's, if it's dominant, she only needs to get one to express it, similarly to a male who only needs to get one of those X chromosomes to express it. So the answer to the first question is that it could be either autosomal or sex-linked, but the gene is most likely dominant. And I'll write that here. And then examining the Generation 3 offspring. So the mating between these two produces something interesting where one of the children is unaffected. So we this is this is something that reaffirms what we have been talking about earlier. The female that is affected here, you can only really determine whether somebody is a carrier or just homozygous based on their offspring, which is what um, I'm circling in generation three. So because these two parents are affected, but one of their children is not, that means that they both have to be a carrier because if it's a dominant disease and every and both parents are homozygous dominant then all the children will have to come out affected but because one is not affected we can assume that the parents are heterozygous 
because a fourth of the time, as we're seeing here exactly, they will be recessive and not show, um, not express that disease, disease dominant trait. So as we're seeing up here, if this female was AA and this male was AA, all of their children would have to express would all be colored in because they would be expressing that. But we know that at least one of the children between this mating pair is actually not affected, which would tell us that this um, incoming parent has to be heterozygous. So this is what I really like about pedigrees. Um, you can find out a lot of information by just kind of starting at the base and going up and looking at who's a carrier, who's not, how many times does it show up, um, does it show up a lot, it, could that indicate dominance, is it only affecting males, if it's only affecting males in a pedigree that's a really good indication um, of X-linked. And yeah, no problem, thank you for coming. So we looked at between I said this in a different way, but basically if it was recessive, all offspring would have to be affected because if you have two affected parents and you're assuming that both those parents are homozygous, recessive if it's a recessive gene. But because we know that it's dominant, one of their kids um, got two recessive alleles and did not carry or um, pass on the disease. So moving on, how could the mode of inheritance be determined experimentally? And I understand that we only have 13 minutes left. Um, there's only two questions left, so we should be done here pretty much on time. Um, so outline the experimental crosses you would need to make to solve each problem. And then here we are starting with a new one. So three new traits have been discovered in a population of Drosophila. Tapping a behavior, behavioral mutant, which the fly taps one few, foot constantly. Single stripe pigmentation change that leads to a long stripe down the back and angular, causes angular bends and bristles that are normally straight. So these are all um, recessive or abnormal. The position of the three genes on the chromosomes are unknown. Given two pure breeding homozygous lines and using an additional cross of normal, normal, normal females with tapping, single striped, and angular males, describe the appropriate genetic experiments needed to establish whether any of these traits are caused by genes that are autosomal or sex linked. So one, I would cross normal, normal, normal with tapping, single striped, angular males. And then this would produce the F1 generation and the alleles expressed in the F1 generation would show us what is dominant.
the next thing I would do is mate the F1 males with females that are homozygous recessive for all three. And I'm using A, B, and C synonymously with the three traits. I would do the same thing, uh, but in reverse. So after doing these two, we could determine the ratio of phenotypes um, for each trait as a whole and then compare the ratio of offspring for each sex. So assuming normal is dominant in all cases, then a cross would um, look like this for autosomal. We would have But then if it was X-linked, it would look something like that, but this is um, only one part of it. We would have to do multiple different crosses. Um, and then we would just see that the ratios of offsprings and phenotypes would be um, in this case, it'd be the same for both sex length and autosomal. Um, but in sex length, the, the results would differ where a male would show the dominant phenotype that is mated with a recessive female. Then all the females would show dominant, but all the males would be uh, recessive because they're getting that X chromosome from mom. So if sex linked, just to say this more simply, female showing with dominant male would produce all dominant females and all recessive males. Last question. How would we determine if that they um, are linked or unlinked? If they are unlinked, then the probability of offspring with a given set of phenotypes, for example, normal, one stripe, angular, is to be equal to the product of individuals um, for each occurring as separate crosses. Um, so this is, for, for an example, if the genes are autosomal, then the F1 mating of this then we would expect to see um, half normal, half one stripe, half angular, and 
the probability of all these together is 1 8th. So if A and B are linked, the results would be much different because then the cross becomes something a little different. get a half chance of this, a half chance of this, and then if no crossing over happens, of course, that's what we're assuming this whole time, and we're getting this and this, then our chances of CC is half and CC is half. So what I'm doing here is I'm just breaking this up into its um, parts. So linked and unlinked is how far the genes are to each other on a chromosome. Linked genes are super close together. Unlinked genes are like extremely far apart or even on different chromosomes. But what the uh, the importance of unlinked and linked, which is not um, I'm not explaining very well in this problem, is that crossing over with unlinked genes has a lot more possibilities than linked. So we're assuming a certain probability to occur with linked and a certain probability to occur with unlinked. Um, if the genes are very close together and there's not a lot of crossing over that happens, they, they tend to move together. Um, let me think of an example to help with this. Um, also something specific is that unlinked genes assort independently. But I... Crossing over is what we talked about last week where when chromosomes are lined up with each other, genetic information gets swapped between the two, remember that? So if you have this chromosome, and this chromosome, and they did crossing over events, then you would get um, this chromosome with like blue parts in it, this chromosome would have part red in it. So that's what crossing over is. It's just crossing over genetic information that's like each other. So when you have a chromosome that has unlinked genes that's undergoing crossing over with, with um, another chromosome. Here, let me write this with actual genes to make this easier. So let's say you have A and B. And these are two genes, and they're pretty close together. This crossover event can happen here, right? And so, let's just do this. Let's make this bottom one blue. So if that crossover happens, then this is what your chromosomes look like. And so basically, when you're getting two chromosomes that are super close together that are linked, there are less, um, the X, 
this x denoting a crossover. There are less crossovers that can happen than can here. There's more recombination that can occur. So what I'm trying to show you with this example is that if the genes are not linked, we expect the probability of offspring with a given set of phenotypes to be equal to the product of the individual probabilities for each occurring as separate crosses. So if the genes are autosomal, then the F1 mating is this. And then if the genes are not linked, this is what we would expect. We would expect to see half normal, half one stripe, half angular, because all of those probabilities are equal. And yes, that's exactly right. So more combinations can happen with unlinked. So the probability of all these characteristics showing in the same thing is 1 8. But if they're linked, then we get different results where this cross can be together, and then this is separate. So what this is showing when I'm doing A, B, A, B, I'm showing that these these are linked, but then C is somewhere else. That's why these are together and these are not. Cool. So I hope that that helps. The key to this should be posted. Um, that is the last question on today's worksheet. So do you folks have any questions for me before I let you go? Um, one reminder is that next Tuesday the 23rd and then Tuesday of week 10 will be live streams. Um, I know it's been flipping back and forth. I hope next quarter is more steady for you folks. But for the next two weekends, um, the next two weeks, sorry, we're actually going to have it on Tuesday till the end of the term. But that's the only thing that, that was the only update. So awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. I hope that you have a really nice weekend and are looking forward to the upcoming holiday, and I will see you guys. Oh, sorry. Uh, AB is linked and CC is unlinked. In this, in this example. This would be A and B, and then C is somewhere over here. Sorry, I didn't answer that. Um, yeah, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Bye.